We are very happy to welcome uh, Jesse Shapiro here today, a brand new member in the Quantitative Life Sciences uh, program and a recent arrival at McGill. Um, and he has a really interesting uh, background before getting here. So he started at McGill with a BSc in biology, um, then Oxford University for a master's, master's degree, um, MIT for a PhD in computational systems and biology, and a postdoctoral fellowship at the Broad, followed by um, a number of years at the University of Montreal, where he had a Canada research chair in microbial evolutionary genomics. I'm really thrilled to be a member of QLS. Um, but the PhD program I did at MIT, computational and systems biology, uh, is very much, I, I think, has the same philosophy and, and, and kind of scope of, as, as, as QLS. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited um, to be uh, uh, part of the QLS program and to, to interact with um, this cohort and future cohorts of, of PhD students. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about pan-genome evolution on human timescales. Uh, my, my Twitter handle is there, my lab website. Um, I'll put those up at the end as well. So if you want to contact me or uh, check out more about the lab. All right, so I'm going to start with a little bit of history. So um, the discovery of the pan genome. So this concept that different members of a species can encode different sets of genes. And uh, this dates back more or less to the early 2000s. Um, so around, so in, in 2002, a, the study by Welch et al. compared uh, three E. coli genomes that had been sequenced um, and looked at the number of, of shared genes between them. So I'm going to start with a question and you can just think about it or, or uh, people can even throw out their answers in the chat. There's not too many people. There's actually a fair number of people logged in. Okay, so you, you can write your answers in the chat or you can even holler it out. So uh, if we compared three human genomes and asked what, what percentage of genes are shared, right, where you, me, and Celia uh, share a homologue of that gene versus genes that might be unique to one of us. So what percentage would be shared? We do actually have an answer in the chat. All right, so let's see. Let's see if I can. There's the chat. Let's see. Most of it will be the same, says uh, Bianca. Okay, 80%. Not over 90%. 99%. 99.9%. All right, I'll leave it there. So that's, I, you know, I, I'm not going to actually put an exact convergent has been achieved. We're sort of we're 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 hitting an asymptote there. So uh, that's right. I mean, it's something like 99 or even 99 for 0.9 percent. I'm not going to put an exact figure on it, but really, the vast majority of the 20,000 or so um, human genes are are common to all humans. And there there can be some exceptions where uh, there might be uh, occasional deletions or duplications, or maybe even a virus integrating and, and, and bringing a new gene. But I just want to contrast this with uh, what these authors saw in E. coli, and they were really surprised. So that this three-way genome comparison, these three strains, um, and this is a quote from this paper, um, amazingly, only 39.2% of their combined sets of protein coding genes actually are common to all three strains, okay? So then uh, this is the core genome, is this 39.2. And then the accessory genes are all of these ones, 585 or even 1600 and some genes that are present in this one strain, but not another. All right, so the pan genome can, can be um, pretty dramatically different than the genome of any one given organism. And, and uh, for, for the students here, um, I suggested this as a, a journal club paper that we can discuss a bit later, uh, which is sort of an introduction, but also kind of an, an opinion piece on why prokaryotes have pan genomes. And they phrase this not as a question, but as like, this is why. Um, and and, and, and we, we can talk about those reasons in a moment. 
Um, so just to sort of define these kind of Venn diagrams, right? So I, I think from that E. coli comparison, it should have been pretty clear from the example, but the idea is that the, the core genome are the set of genes that have a, a homolog present in um, each individual, so each genome that's compared, right, which are these ellipses. Um, the accessory genes are genes that are present in one or just a subset of those genomes, and the whole, the whole thing combined, the pan-genome, is the total set of genes encoded by all members of a species. And for bacteria, uh, this can be quite dramatically different uh, from the genome of any, any given member of the species. All right, so um, this is a quote from this uh, McInerney, McNally, and O'Connell paper. Uh, they conclude that pan genomes are the result of adaptive, not neutral evolution. So uh, there's a, basically all these genes in the pan genome are there for a reason. They're helping bacteria adapt to a particular ecological niche. Uh, they're, it's not just random. They're, 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 they're not viruses and selfish elements. Um, they are really have an adaptive role, not neutral. Um, so I assigned this paper because it provides a good introduction, but then this is not an uncontroversial statement. And um, actually in the same year, uh, in uh, early 2017, uh, this paper came out um, from these other authors, a short communication, which essentially provided a neutral interpretation of pan genomes. And they concluded that accessory gene turnover is for large part dictated by neutral evolution. So this is a, a neutral interpretation. Um, and it's a short communication with one figure. So I'll actually just show you the figure rather than trying to, sum, uh, to summarize. And essentially what they did is uh, each point here is a different bacterial species uh, with, with many members. So uh, dozens of, of, of representatives of that species downloaded from NCBI GenBank. And what they did here is they plotted um, the synonymous diversity in the core genome. So this is just point mutations at synonymous sites. So sites that don't change the protein structure. And this is kind of an approximation for a molecular clock, right? So point mutations just ticking along over evolutionary time. And they plot this against a measure of genome fluidity, which is uh, their measure of pan-genome diversity. So it, it essentially, gene presence absence, um, genes coming in and out of the genome over evolutionary time. And they see this uh, positive correlation and their interpretation is that the pan genome basically follows a molecular clock where gene gains and losses ticks along over evolutionary time as these presumably neutral point mutations also tick along. So their parsimonious explanation for this is that most of pan-genome evolution can be explained by a neutral model. And it would actually take um, a more complicated model to invoke all of these, these niches and um, adaptive value for pan-genomes. Okay, so uh, we, we, we do have a bit of a, a controversy or at least different interpretations of, of these pan-genomes that are on the table. And um, most of what we know about pan genomes is based on relatively long evolutionary time scales. So actually in this plot, each of these points is, is a bacterial species, but the genetic diversity in, in that, um, within that species can actually be millions or, or, or hundreds of millions of years old. So this is based on pretty ancient um, divergences. And, and, and this is the case uh, for both um, this Andreani paper where that plot comes from and also other comparisons. Uh, so this paper by um, uh, Sila, Wolf, and, and Kunin um, actually underlines a lot of what's in that McInerney paper, which is a perspective paper. Uh, they really rely on, on this paper um, to, for their conclusions. And that also is based on genome sequences downloaded from NCBI. So when I say long or unknown evolutionary timescales, it's really just downloading everything that is available in a database. And so we, we don't really have a sense of, of evolutionary time scale. So in this talk, um, I'm going to focus on shorter evolutionary time scales, which are arguably more interpretable um, about what's going on. And, and we can actually measure um, uh, evolution at, at the population level, um, at least where we have some sense of time scale. 
So uh, we're going to talk about pangenome evolution uh, during an, in, uh, an acute infection of uh, a, a bacterial pathogen. Uh, so that'll be the first part. And the second part, more broadly, in the human gut microbiome. All right, so I'm going to start with Vibrio cholera. So this is the pathogen of, of interest. Um, a lot of my work centers on Vibrio cholera. So I'll give you a little introduction and highlight some, some aspects of its, its uh, genomics and its ecology. So Vibrio cholera is native to aquatic systems. So you can find it uh, in estuaries, um, uh, coastal areas around the world. It's probably native to the Ganges River Delta. So there's a lot of Vibrio cholera cases around Bangladesh, but uh, you can find uh, Vibrio cholera in the marine environment off the coast of New Hampshire, um, uh, um, probably in the Gulf of, of St. Lawrence, although I haven't looked, uh, but there are um, aquatic strains pretty much everywhere around the world. They live by forming biofilms on, on zooplankton and other crustaceans. As, so they have a whole bunch of niches um, in this aquatic environment. One particular group of Vibrio cholera that I'll, I'll refer to as the pandemic group, which is basically a clonal expansion, um, which is really just a small subset of the genetic diversity that's present around the world in all of these aquatic systems. So this clonal expansion um, is really what's responsible for the, the disease cholera, where um, the different environmental strains of, of Vibrio cholera can maybe cause um, uh, slight disease, mild diarrhea, um, but really the pandemic group is kind of a professional pathogen that causes severe diarrhea and dehydration and actually is, is probably more specialized to the human gut environment. So uh, to, to make a long story short, we think of cholera as a waterborne disease where someone will, um, will drink uh, contaminated water or food. Um, Vibrio cholera will use the human gut as an amplifier where it will just grow up to trillions and trillions of copies, outcompete uh, pretty much the rest of the gut microbiome. In, in so doing, make this person uh, very sick with diarrhea. Um, and and uh, if untreated, there's about a 50% um, mortality rate where people will die of, of dehydration from this severe watery diarrhea through which the bacterium will disperse back out into the environment or as we're learning, um, uh, more commonly than, than thought, actually from di direct human-to-human uh, -human, uh, transmission or fecal-oral transmission. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, even during these very acute infections that only last a few days or a week, it, it's possible for uh, Vibrio cholera to evolve um, within patients and um, you can ask questions about whether it's actually adapting to that human host environment on very short time scales of, of just a few days of infection. One notable feature of this pandemic group is the cholera toxin. So CTX, um, this is the, the key virulence factor um, that is really responsible for pathogenesis, pathogenesis for this watery uh, diarrhea. And to bring it back to this concept of pangenomes, CTX would be considered to be part of the core genome of the pandemic group. So it's really uh, present in all members of the pandemic group. And it's present sporadically um, in other environmental um, isolates of Vibrio cholera. So it's necessary, but not sufficient for pandemics. So it's part of the, the pangenome of Vibrio cholera, the species as a whole, part of the core of the pandemic group, but uh, because it seems to be necessary but not sufficient, leads to the question, what else is necessary for, to explain the success of the pandemic group at um, infecting humans and causing disease? So the, the first question I'm gonna ask in, in this talk is are there other virulence adaptive polymorphisms, not just in the pangenome, so not just the presence of CTX, but in the core genome. So more subtle uh, polymorphisms that are also uh, required for this full-blown pandemic phenotype. 
So what we did is a comparative genomic study, uh, which um, identified OMPU as a candidate um, VAP. So I'm not going to go into the details of this study, um, but basically we did, we screened phylogenetic trees uh, to find ones that looked um, interesting. So this is the, um, the, the gene tree for OMPU. And you can see that it really um, contrasts with the core genome phylogeny. So if you build a phylogeny based on the entire core genome, so that alignment, you get this star-like phylogenetic tree where essentially all, all these different lineages are kind of equally related to each other with not much structure. And you can see the, I'm always going to show the pandemic group as, as this one branch um, in, in orange. And you can see that the, the phylogeny for OMPU looks quite different where there is more structure, where we have this, uh, the, the pandemic group that's here, but we have these pandemic-like alleles where I'm, I'm again um, just showing the names of these two uh, genomes, GBE658 and 428, which in general, right, so on average in, in the core genome, they're just pretty distant, as distant as everything else uh, from the pandemic group. But just for OMPU, they seem to encode alleles that are more similar. So they branch, they're not identical, but they branch closer to the pandemic group um, compared to these other um, uh, genomes, right? And, and I, sh I should say that uh, the pandemic group is in orange, but then in, in contrast to that, all these blue branches are just environmental um, isolates of Vibrio cholera. So they're not um, associated with pandemic disease. So our hypothesis here is that these pandemic-like alleles that are present in environmental strains might confer virulence traits. So, so there might be these sort of uh, virulence adaptive traits that are circulating in the environment that haven't quite achieved their potential because they don't have all of the necessary requirements for pandemic disease. Uh, so with uh, my collaborator, Salvador Almagro Moreno, we did most colonization experiments to, to, to test this hypothesis. And um, OMPU was really a nice candidate because uh, it was actually already known that a knockout of OMPU will reduce the ability of a pandemic vibrio cholera strain uh, to colonize a mouse by about a log fold, about um, tenfold, uh, where you have um, wild type pandemic vibrio cholera versus a knockout. And we're just measuring how, how well they can, um, they can colonize a mouse. So uh, consistent with our expectation, if you replace, if you don't just do the knockout, but you actually replace the pandemic um, OMPU allele with either the GBE428 or 658, so these pandemic-like alleles, consistent with their, their sequence similarity, right? So they're not identical, but they have a similar sequence. They also allow uh, almost pandemic-like colonization of the mouse uh, compared to this allele, which is sort of all the way over the other end of the phylogenetic tree, so quite different in sequence space, behaves pretty much like a knockout. So this suggests that OMPU um, is a genuine virulence adaptive polymorphism where the pandemic-like alleles uh, behave basically like the pandemic um, uh, version of this gene um, and allow Vibrio cholera to colonize a, a mammalian host. There appears to be a trade-off where if you test another phenotype, so this, uh, this is colonization of a mouse, but we also tested uh, biofilm formation. So this is just a measure of the thickness of, of a biofilm that's formed um, by these different strains. And it really shows the opposite, where the OMPU knockout forms really good biofilm. This um, environmental kind of allele, GBE114, also forms really good biofilm. But either the pandemic or the pandemic-like alleles really form very little biofilm. So it's, it's a tr it seems to be a trade-off where you're either good at virulence, so host colonization, or you're good at biofilm formation. 
Okay, um, so moving on to uh, variation within individual patients. So that, that first bit was really looking at the, the broad diversity of Vibrio cholera um, uh, across aquatic environments and across all the diversity in, uh, in pandemic strains. Now we're gonna ask um, what's happening within individual patients. So the first question we ask is, do we expect to see any evolution within patients? And um, the answer to this question, it depends on the mutation rate, right? So higher rates of mutation, higher chance of, of, of seeing um, uh, evolution or seeing genetic diversity, and of course the time, so the amount of time for that diversity to be generated. We can kind of turn, make this binary where we know that viruses have higher mutation rates than bacteria, and chronic infections have a longer amount of time in a patient in order to see evolution. So there have been examples, uh, classic examples in viruses like HIV and HCV, um, where there, there are um, examples of, um, of evolution of pathogens within patients. Um, in bacteria as well, so Burkholderia infections or even Bacteroides, which is the commensal um, in the human gut, uh, they're there for quite a long amount of time. And then in viruses um, that are acute infections, but then have relatively high mutation rates like Ebola and Lassa virus. So Vibrio cholera really is in this kind of nether region of a low mutation rate and an acute infection. So we don't know if we are really um, expecting to see evolution happening within patients. So uh, to undertake this work, this is a project with collaborators um, at MGH in Boston, at the ICDDRB in Bangladesh, where we're getting samples uh, from cholera patients. And it's really the work of a, a PhD student who just graduated from my lab, Ines Lavad, uh, with two postdocs, um, Eve Tekka and um, Jean-Baptiste Leduc. So what Ines did, this was published a couple of years ago, is she looked at uh, five cholera patients from Bangladesh. So these are the labeled with a B and then three from Haiti um, after the, 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 the Haitian outbreak in 2010. And from each of those patients, she isolated uh, between it, about 10 and 20 individual um, colonies of Vibrio cholera and sequenced each of them in order to compare them and see if they differed by either point mutations or uh, gene gain and loss events in, in the pan genome. And she did a control where she took one of those colonies and then plated it out again, uh, just to control for any mutations that might have happened in the lab or any sequencing artifacts for when we do Illumina sequencing, um, there's a particular error rate. And just to make sure that all of our quality filters for calling mutations uh, were such that we don't see any variation um, in this control. So that's indeed the case. So um, each of these circles represents an individual genome that we sequenced. And if it's gray, it means there's no variation. So if the control is clean, there's no variation. Um, and these colored uh, circles are point mutations that we observe. So you can see that uh, for most of these patients, we really see no point mutations and we see up to three in this one individual. So relatively low level of, uh, of, of point mutation. We can also look at the core genome, so gene presence absence. So this is a heat map showing um, across the different patients, 155 genes that vary in their presence absence. So this is our, our pan genome analysis. So red means the gene is present, um, black means it's absent. So this is our control, uh, which was subcultured from B1, so from patient B1, so you can see it looks, the profile is, is pretty much identical uh, to patient B1, and you can see that there's no variation within the control. So again, um, uh, that's a good sign. That means that we're, we're confident in our ability to detect uh, gene presence absence without a lot of false positives. So what are these chunks? So this is just sort of clustered according to these patterns. So um, this, this cluster A is an in element, so it's basically a plasmid that can integrate um, into the genome. And you can see that it's actually part of the core for Bangladesh. So all these patients have all of these genes, uh, but in Haiti, it can be variable and even to be, it can even be variable within a patient. Um, this is a kappa phage, so also a, a, a phage, a, a virus that is integrated into the bacterial genome. 
And again, you can see that it's, it's um, present in all members of patient B1 and B5, but it can be more variable with the other patients. And then there's these rare genes, um, which are of, of particular interest um, uh, because they don't really follow to a cathophage. And we could also annotate, so we could blast these genes uh, against GenBank and see where did they come from. And you can see that most of them um, were, have been seen previously in Vibrio cholera. So these are sort of known members of the Vibrio cholera pan genome. Um, a few other ones are, uh, have been seen in other Vibrios. But in this rare category, um, you can see that there's this set of genes that are, are present in just um, one or two um, individual isolates from this patient H2 from Haiti that have the nearest blast hit to Bacteroides. So this is a completely different um, uh, phylum of bacteria. So Bacteroides is a common uh, gut commensal. And it seems like actually these are 20 genes that are probably on a plasmid that's been transferred from Bacteroides into Vibrio cholera. And this happens quite rarely because we just see it in this one um, Vibrio cholera isolate from one patient. So we're capturing these kind of rare events. So uh, to summarize these results, so we see between zero and three point mutations within each patient, so fairly low levels of point mutation. Um, quite a bit more diversity in the pan genome, so up to 100 genes gained or lost per patient. Um, at least one event per patient. And these are mostly known genes from the Vibrio cholera gene pool, but we also see these 20 genes on a plasmid that seems to have been acquired from Bacteroides. So a very, uh, probably a recent horizontal gene transfer event that we're capturing at these very fine time scales. So uh, the, the headline there is that gene content, so pan genome, evolves rapidly and probably at an even faster rate um, than point mutation within these patients. And it can have phenotypic consequences. So we decided to look at biofilm formation um, because as I mentioned, it can be an important factor for survival um, in the marine environment. So attachment to, to zooplankton, uh, but, but maybe less adaptive um, uh, and maybe even trading off with survival um, in the human gut. And uh, you can see that in these biofilm formation assays, um, we compared um, the, the probable ancestral strain, so the, um, the isolate that probably colonized that patient, and we compared it to the strain with this plasmid that seems to have been acquired from bacteroids. You can see that it knocks down biofilm formation uh, to a level that's pretty much as low as a known biofilm knockout strain of Vibrio cholera. So, um, just acquiring this plasmid and the strain with the plasmid is otherwise um, genotypically identical. So no other point mutations were detectable, really seems to be identical, uh, identical except for having this plasmid, um, has a strong phenotypic consequence on the ability of, um, of Vibrio cholera to form biofilms. So it, um, it reduces biofilm formation. And these are just some nice pictures um, where you can see um, uh, an example of the ancestral strain. So here Vibrio is stained in red and you can just see a lot of, a lot of red, quite dense. And this, um, this plasmid mutant has forms a much more diffuse kind of broken up biofilm. So this is quite interesting. Um, uh, phenotypes can be gained and lost very quickly um, uh, due to pangenome uh, changes. So to summarize this first part of the talk, so um, over evolutionary time, we can think about pathogen emergence. So um, the origin of the pandemic lineage. So we get major adaptations from the pan genome. So the cholera toxin was definitely a key adaptation, um, allowing for the emergence of this pathogen. Um, but as I showed, we, you need the right core genome background to exploit these adaptations. So, not only do you need uh, 
uh, to have CTX, but you need the right allele of OMPU, for example, right? So you need these other um, virulence adaptive polymorphisms in, in the core genome as well. So genetic background matters. And then uh, on shorter timescales within host, uh, the pan genome changes faster than the core, and these phenotypic changes from the pan genome um, may or may not be adaptive. So I think it's tempting to speculate this trade off where biofilm formation is adaptive in the aquatic environment, and maybe it's actually maladaptive for some reason in the host, where Fibro cholera wants to come in and and stick, uh, um, adhere to the gut lining and colonize, but maybe it doesn't want to stick too much. It doesn't want to form a really robust biofilm or not the same kind of biofilm that it would form in the environment. It wants to be able to let go and disperse. Uh, so that's sort of a potential scenario, but we, we don't really know um, if these phenotypic changes are, are really adaptive or not. This is a, a working hypothesis. So um, to get at this question, uh, are pan genomes adaptive? And, and this is sort of this, this question that's raised by um, the, the, the McInerney et al. Uh, paper that, that you read. And to get at this, we decided to, to zoom in to shorter evolutionary timescales again, so to, um, to, to put aside these large scale comparisons of uh, bacteria in GenBank. And, and to do this, uh, we looked within the human microbiome, and we actually looked at mobile genes in the human microbiome um, in this, uh, this cohort that uh, my, my uh, collaborator, Ilana Brito, um, sampled uh, people from Fiji. Uh, so this is human gut microbiomes from Fiji, uh, where we know quite a bit about the people's uh, diet. We know about their, their social structure. So um, their, their household and the village that they come from. And um, in this paper, she was investigating how microbiomes are structured on those, on those scales. And a fantastic master student in, in my lab, um, Arnaud Magessen, um, decided to reanalyze this data um, really with this question of, of pan-genome adaptation in mind. And his, his co-advisor, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of Adrian uh, Serohijos, who's um, in biochemistry and bioinformatics at UDM. I should get a picture of Adrian. So uh, we, we undertook this project together. So what were Ilana's criteria for HGP? So this is from her 2016 paper. And she used a simple heuristic where she used about um, over 500 whole genome sequences, um, either that she sequenced from Fiji or that were available as part of the Human Microbiome Project, so from the US. And she looked for regions of the genome that were over 99% identical at the nucleotide level, over 500 base pairs, between two or more genomes that, were, um, that shared less than 97% identity in 16S. Um, so 16S is a, a taxonomic marker, and we know that any bacteria that are, um, that are under 97% identical in 16S um, are definitely different species. So they're probably even different genera. And so if they share a nearly identical stretch of DNA, that's probably a recent horizontal gene transfer event. So she used this criteria, which we, um, which we continue with, uh, in order to define mobile genes, okay? Um, and so then what we're going to do is we're going to take these mobile genes and we're going to map metagenomic reads. So just sequencing DNA directly from stool of a sample of people from Fiji. And um, in order for them to be included in our analysis, we're going to require um, 10x coverage, right? So we require that these genes be um, reasonably well covered over at least 50% of their length to be included in our analysis. And in this, uh, in this analysis, we're going to use coverage, um, so relative coverage, as a proxy for the census population size of these genes, right? So a gene that has more coverage is present in more copies in this metagenomic sample too, for example, right? So in this person, in, in this uh, particular 
um, gut microbiome. So uh, in this data set, we have 175 Fiji gut metagenomes, so 175 people from Fiji, and a data set of about 8,000 mobile genes that we know are present um, in more than one species. All right, so to do this population genetic analysis, um, so, so we're interested in adaptation, right? So we wanna learn something um, about whether these genes are adaptive or not. So we're gonna use the tools of population genetics to do so. Um, and so a first step in that is to identify single nucleotide variants in those mobile genes. And we're gonna do it just by mapping those reads and with certain um, quality filters, we can identify when those reads um, differ from the reference gene um, at a particular nucleotide site. And uh, from those SNVs, we can calculate two estimates of the effective population size. So this is a key measure in population genetics, which tells us something um, about the demographic or um, selective history of that particular gene. So the first is theta s, um, and the um, uh, this measures is particularly sensitive to low frequency alleles. So even if there's just one read uh, that that um, has an SNV compared to the reference, we'll count that uh, to, uh, towards our, our estimate um, equally with a mutation that's at higher frequency. And then theta pi, pi is the nucleotide diversity. So this is looking at um, all pairwise differences um, between reads. And this, this measure is more sensitive to intermediate frequency alleles. So it'll be, um, it, 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 it's weighted towards um, alleles that are at say 50% frequency in the population um, and, and, and less sensitive to ones that are um, at 1% frequency. So uh, to show this graphically, um, uh, it's, is maybe easier. So um, uh, a, a phylogeny or genealogy that looks more like this with all of these long internal branches, if you imagine just distributing mutations on this kind of genealogy, um, because of these long terminal branches, most mutations will fall on a terminal branch and be at low frequency. Uh, compared to um, a, a genealogy like this, we have these long internal branches so if you just distribute mutations randomly on this tree, uh, they'll tend to fall on these long internal branches um, and be in all of the descendants. So we'll see them at, at intermediate frequency. Okay, so um, whether a genealogy looks more like the one on the left or like the one on the right tells us something about the demographic history or um, whether there's been a, a population expansion or contraction um, or a recent selective sweep. So it's a very quick introduction to sort of uh, uh, these, these population genetic estimates, but um, hopefully you'll get a bit of a feel for them um, as, as we go through the talk. Okay, so we have these, these um, estimates of any from our metagenomes. So our overall question is, um, what are the selective pressures that shape mobile gene evolution in the gut? First question, just, just to, to sort of understand our data a bit better, uh, we can ask how do mobile gene population sizes change with increasing rates of HDD? So naively, we would ask to, we would expect a, a positive correlation where HDT rate, so the, um, which here we're gonna uh, just quantify very simply as the number of species. So these are our, our reference genomes that contain the gene, right? So it can be present in one, two, three, up to about um, 16 different species is, is our, our maximum um, um, gene mobility or HDT rate. And we'd expect this to be positively correlated. So the more species that contain a gene, we would expect to see um, more coverage. So more, um, more copies of that gene. And so we would just see a, a higher level of, of coverage um, in the metagenome. So this will be kind of a estimate of the census population size. Now, this, tri this prediction is not trivial uh, because these mobile genes might be deleterious to cells. So it might be that they are transferred to multiple species, but they're kept at low frequency within 
each of those species, right? So they could actually be kind of parasitic elements that are um, invading new species, but then kind of kept um, at, at low frequencies within each of those species. They could be under negative frequency dependent selection, um, which I guess is kind of a special case of, of deleterious where they're advantageous at lower frequencies, but then when they reach higher frequencies, they become disadvantageous. Um, and the other thing is there's just noise, right? So um, the, the x-axis here, so our estimate of gene mobility, HDT rate, um, is based on a sample of isolate genomes from um, the human, mic uh, um, human microbiome, but it, it, it's not necessarily representative or exhaustive. So this, this metric might just be noisy or, or a bit biased. So the real data, this is just one sample. So to give you a sense, um, we do see a positive correlation, but you can really see the amount of noise um, that's, that's in there on a, a log log plot, okay? So it's not uh, a very clean positive correlation. Um, but it's, it's fairly reproducible where this is just the distribution of those regression coefficients across all our 175 samples. And they do tend to be positive, but, but they, they really vary um, quite a lot in terms of um, their coefficients. But the coefficients do tend to be positive. So this gives us a sense of, of, um, of this relationship in the data. So there's a lot of variability. What can explain it? Could this be explained by gene-specific or person-specific selective pressures? So what do I mean by this? So uh, you can imagine this is, this is not real data, this is just abstract. So basically our data is this matrix, right? Where we have, we sampled 175 people and we have these uh, several thousand mobile genes. And then each entry in the matrix will be um, something that we measure about that gene, right? So it can be, our estimate of the effective population size, the theta S or theta pi. Um, it can be coverage, um, uh, it, right? So some, some feature. And, and, and so we're gonna ask, um, is there more variation across genes or across people? So um, if there's variation across people, you can imagine these are factors that might affect the whole microbiome. So things like diet or lifestyle or something that at the level of a person will affect the evolution of, of all genes in the microbiome. Versus genes, genes have different functions. So this can be something really more at the level um, of, of, um, of cellular pathways that, um, uh, that explain the evolution of these mobile genes. Okay, so we can look at the distribution. So this is showing an example um, uh, this is, sorry, it's a bit blurry. This is theta S, okay? Um, so across 175 people, the distribution of that particular estimate of the effective population size. And um, there's relatively, there's some variation, but these are largely overlapping. And if you look at the variation across genes, and here, this is just a, a subsample of 175 genes. There's more than that, but this is just to match the sample size of the number of people. Uh, you can see that these distributions are much more non-overlapping. So there's a lot more variation across genes than across people. And this is true. I showed you the example for um, uh, theta S. Um, this is a, a typo here, right? So this should say theta S, theta pi. Um, and their difference, which is, which is called Tajima's D, kind of the, um, just the balance between those two. Um, it's also uh, true for another metric, which you may be familiar with, DNDS. So this is the, um, the rate of non-synonymous mutations normalized by the rate of uh, synonymous mutations. So it's a measure of selective constraint at the, at the protein level. And more variation is accounted by gene function, so at the level of COG categories, compared to human factors, so things like age, sex, household, or village. So we can then ask, um, how does gene mobility affect sequence evolution? So we have our measure of gene mobility, how many species contain that gene, and we are going to correlate gene mobility versus these different population genetic metrics. So here I'm just showing 
theta pi, uh, theta w, sorry, that's the same thing as theta s, different nomenclature, sorry about that. And, um, and their, their difference, which is tangent d. And you can see that, uh, and, and each, um, each column here is a different person. And the heat map is showing the, re the regression slope. Okay, so you can see that theta pi is, is overwhelmingly negatively um, associated with gene mobility. Theta pi is positively associated, which means that tangent d is, is negative because it's, it's theta pi minus theta w. So what does this mean? Okay, um, how do we interpret this? Um, even, even population geneticists will have you know, different interpretations for this. It can mean a lot of different things. Um, but essentially what, what, what's happening here is that mobile genes are spreading rapidly across many species in the microbiome, um, possibly due to positive selection or sort of like a demographic expansion. So you can think of it like this, where each dot um, or star is a copy of the gene in the microbiome, so in, in multiple species, so the total number of copies. And the star here is a mutation in that gene, okay? So here the star is at pretty low frequency, um, which would lead to a negative tagimus D, okay? So sort of an excess of low frequency variants. And this is kind of a measure of how fast the gene is spreading, right? So these mobile genes are spreading across many species. Uh, and, and the definition of rapidly, this asterisk here, is they're spreading faster than mutations can achieve high frequency. Okay, so only they're, it, it, they're kept with um, low frequency mutations. So this is kind of our interpretation of this. But some genes behave differently. And this is kind of the, alter, the, the alternative scenario is that tagimus D increases with mobility. So in this case, as genes are spreading through the microbiome um, over time, uh, they, they are, are actually um, accumulating mutations at high or intermediate frequency. Uh, and this can be due to um, different kinds of scenarios, um, including um, uh, balancing selection where intermediate alleles are beneficial, um, or maybe that genes, uh, that these genes are adaptive in some species, but not in others. And so that the overall mixture comes out to this intermediate frequency. So um, what do these look like? And th this plot is really kind of synthesizing all, all of the, the results I've shown you so far. So um, the, the axis here is this, uh, this relationship between coverage and gene mobility. So as I showed you before, this is basically always positive, uh, but the, degree, the, um, the, the slope varies. This is now broken down by these different cog functional categories of genes. So the top one is category X, which is mobile and prophages and transposons. So these are just known mobile kind of selfish elements, and they're responsible for a lot of that slope, right? So they have a really strong relationship between coverage, so copy number, and, and the estimate of, of mobility. And then the colors here are showing you um, the strength of this relationship between tagimus D and mobility. So um, as expected, it's mostly red, okay? So they're mainly following this kind of scenario where um, mutations stay at low frequency as genes spread across the microbiome. But there are these exceptions, which are this kind of blue scenario. So these are um, things like category B, uh, defense mechanisms. So these can be things, um, uh, involved in, in uh, phage bacteria um, interactions, so like CRISPR or other defenses against phages, um, secondary metabolism, um, and a few other functions that seem to behave a bit differently. So this could indicate a different regime of natural selection that's acting on these particular um, COG categories. All right, so... Um, does this mean that pangenome evolution is largely adaptive or not? Do, do, do we need to invoke adaptive value to explain this? So to get at this, uh, we used a relatively simple evolutionary model called SODAPOP that was developed by people in Adrian's lab and then um, extended by Arnaud. 
Um, in a nutshell, we're um, of a simple uh, model of a, a simple microbiome of 10 species. Uh, we have point mutations that are mostly neutral, but we have a distribution of fitness effects where about 30% of non-synonymous mutations are lethal um, and, uh, and, and, and they're drawn from a, a distribution of fitness effects. We have horizontal gene transfer. So we, we have a pan-genome um, uh, where we're, we can vary the rates of HGT and we can vary the adaptive value of, of a gene. Um, we keep the genome size at equilibrium. Uh, we model just 5,000 cells and um, 100,000 generations, um, but genome size stays equilibrium. So we think this is a, um, a reasonable model, at least for the qualitative uh, features of, of our, our data, our microbiome data. So um, briefly, so one, uh, qualitatively, the model nicely recapitulates these trends um, in Tajima's D, so theta pi and theta w. This is the real data from Fiji that I just showed you. Um, these are simulations where now each column is an independent uh, simulation. So broadly speaking, we can recapitulate the same trend. And uh, we did simulations with, uh, as, as I told you, where we can vary um, HGT rate um, from low to high. And the selective coefficient, so the selective advantage on an HGT event, so either with an advantage or neutral. And um, broadly, um, uh, these, these simulations, so you can see the, the color key here is according to those, those parameters. And you can see that the, um, the clustering is more according to HGT rate. So this cluster has high HGT and the, this cluster has lower HGTs, but then you can see within that high HGT cluster, right? So these red and blue simulations, whether um, gene gains by HGT are adaptive or neutral are pretty much just mixed up. And, and, and that's also the case with lower HGT rates. Okay, so it seems that HGT rate, but not selection um, is important in, um, in structuring um, these populations. So maybe we don't need adaptation, we don't need special selective value um, to explain these results. Um, Tajima's D is negatively correlated with gene mobility in 87% of our simulations and 83% of our real samples. So this might just emerge um, um, as selfish genes or, or genes that have selection on their own propagation, but no adaptive value for their host genome. Um, so this might be able to explain um, quite a lot of, of the, the patterns that we see. Um, I will say that um, the correlations are, are much stronger. So an R squared about 0.3 in the simulations and in, in real samples, even though they're quite reproducibly positive, the R squared is quite low. So this implies that there's something else going on um, in real life that's not being captured in our simulation. And whether that's just experimental noise or something else uh, remains to be seen. Um, so what could account for this discrepancy? As I said, it could be noise, um, it could be differential selection. So recall, um, I did show you that different cog functions um, have different relationships between mobility and tachyma's D. So this is the kind of thing that isn't really accounted for in the model. So I do think that there's some differential selection across genes, but importantly, they don't seem to be broadly adapted to their host. So that was a bit of a whirlwind, uh, and this is pretty brand new data. So it's in a preprint that we just put up last week, um, which you can check out. And I will um, wrap up there, and I know that we'll have some time uh, with the students anyway to, to talk. Um, so to, to summarize, um, pan-genome changes can affect phenotypes like biofilm. Not all mobile genes are adapted to the bacterial host. And I think that really came across um, in the Fiji data and the simulations. Um, some of these genes are likely transient. Some are just selfish like phage or any gene that um, just wants to propagate itself with no adaptive benefit to the host. Pan-genomes can evolve quickly. Um, so faster than point mutations in the core genome. So the example from cholera, uh, possibly due to selective sweeps, 
as shown in the Fiji data, and that gene-specific rather than person-specific selective pressures seem to be more relevant. Uh, so with that, I'll thank the members of our lab. Um, for the QLS students out there, I'm open to taking rotation students, obviously uh, remotely and virtually this semester, but that works pretty well for a mostly uh, computational lab. And um, there's just the summer picture to, to warm everybody up as, um, as we get into winter and fall. So um, I'll take questions if there is time. Um, thanks for listening.